I'm going to ask you to begin by uh, basically telling us um, in briefly what you are doing in your field to bring about a cure for HIV. So I'll start, Daria, with you. Mm, briefly. Yes. Mm. <laughs> so what is the main strategy that Merck is working on? Uh, so uh, we are mainly focusing uh, not on steril the sterilizing approach um, uh, that, that Carl um, talked about. Um, we're actually trying to eradicate the virus. Um, I call it um, a game of hide and sleep. Um, we're looking at trying to understand uh, where the virus is, is hiding, where those reservoirs of latently infected cells are located. Um, and by understanding where they're located and also understanding the, the underlying molecular basis um, where, um, where they're kept in this latent um, state, if we can awaken them um, and by awakening them um, have the immune system actually clear uh, clear the virus from so the So flush them out of their hiding Flush them space. out of the hiding space. Perfect. Now, Regan, obviously you're not involved in research, but you're involved in mobilizing people to get involved in research and many other things. How does PAUSE and how do you work toward making a cure? Well, you know, you've, it's been said several times today, the, um, the disbelief that it's possible is corrected by stories and, and, you know, and the media coverage around the issue. So having Tim Brown grace our cover and going in depth on his story and talking about how this is in fact possible. I think there's a, a reticence to believe that we're at that moment in time. You know, we've been at this moment several times where people thought maybe this is the moment. Um, so we do coverage, but also, um, as you said, mobilizing the community. We reach about 70% of all people who are living with HIV in America who know it. Um, and so one of the things we do is advocate and mobilize the community to put pressure on Capitol Hill, to put pressure on the media, local media and national media, to say that you know this is the time to write about this. This is the time we change the game and, and change the world. Um, and so that's what we do. And then I also tell my personal story. I'm living with HIV. And I just want to also thank Ampar. I, uh, was diagnosed in 96, and I woke up this morning and I thought, you know, this is pretty incredible to have survived thanks to the work of AMFAR and to be getting dressed for a cure symposium and to come and meet the man, the first man in the world who's been cured, and, and what that's like, and to have a thought that maybe someday, um, you know, I'll join his ranks. <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. Um, Keith, tell us about what you're doing. Sure. Um, so at the Fred Hutchinson uh, Cancer Research Center in Seattle, we're very fortunate to have uh, been awarded one of the Martin Delaney Collaboratories. Um, and, and our group is really focusing on the gene therapy sorts of approaches to HIV. So we are um, really trying to develop a very specific and very efficient set of tools that will allow us to do genetic surgery so that we can take out things like the CCR5 receptor that, that we've heard a lot about. Um, modify stem cells and T cells to make them resistant and maybe someday in the future to actually go into the body and actually root out the HIV itself and use that as a target and remove that uh, from the body. Again, a very um, targeted and specific way of trying to eradicate HIV from infected people. So when you say targeted, I just want to focus in on mm -hmm. that because uh, what you're talking about is actually something so specific that it would go to a particular part of all the millions of base pairs that make up the DNA of sure. a particular cell right. and snipping out just those or perhaps adding something in. Is yeah, that, that correct? Is, yeah, that's the amazing thing about the technology. There's billions of base pairs within, within the cell. And, and we now have the technology proteins that, that we make, designer proteins that we make that can go through that entire billions of base pairs, three billion base pairs, and find a very specific sequence of 20, cleave that and mutate that. So if that is CCR5, we can knock that out. If that is um, another gene critical for HIV, we can knock that out. If that's HIV itself, we can knock that out. So it is incredibly specific and it's incredibly exciting and this is sort of what we're talking about, that the time is right to do all this because this technology is, is brand new within the last few years and, and it's all kind of coming together now um, together with some of the other things we'll hear about. Um, that I think are going to work together to allow us to cure the disease. 
Fantastic. Marty, you are a clinical researcher. You actually take the things that people have spent years working in the bench and then try them out in people to be a little bit reductive. Talk about what you're doing at uh, Aaron Diamond. Right. So um, I think most people know we were amongst the first groups to try to understand whether or not the new uh, uh, triple combination therapy that was discovered back in the, in the 90s and, and uh, early 2000s, you know, try to understand what the limits of those drugs were, and, and as uh, Carl showed very nicely, when people were treated and then stopped drug, the virus came rebounding back. The, the fundamental question is still, and it's an unanswered question, whether three drugs does quote unquote completely suppress virus replication, or do you need to up the ante, so to speak? And it's really a very fundamental question because, for example, if the work that dairy is doing is to try to pull virus out. Well, if you superimpose the new agents on a less than suppressive <coughs> regimen, you might actually make things worse than better. Because if virus replication is not completely suppressed, then there are susceptible cells that may get infected when you pull infectious virus out of places where it's kind of quote unquote inactive. So we tried very hard to address this issue by, with the support of Merck and uh, um, other companies by um, upping the ante and comparing five drug regimen to a three drug regimen in newly infected patients. And we generally use newly infected patients because A, their, their immune systems are relatively minimally impacted and also it's very easy or relatively easy to study their viral populations compared to patients who have been infected for, for prolonged periods of time. And what we found is we're, we're kind of stymied because using the assays that we have available to us, and we have a list of about 12 different assays, both virologic and immunologic, we don't see necessarily a big difference between patients treated with five drugs and patients treated with three drugs. So the question is, 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 is are our negative findings proof that there is no ongoing replication, or are we just unable to find it? Because the absence of data doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't exist. Right, and there's an easy way to think about this. Right. We're in a hotel with, what, a thousand rooms, and your assays might look in 900 of those rooms, but that leaves 100 rooms where a little bit of HIV might still be alive, might still be replicating, might still be making new copies of itself. And with your assays, you wouldn't be able to see because you can't see into those 100 rooms. Absolutely. And uh, so, and again, thanks to AMFAR because AMFAR has funded uh, many of our efforts to try to answer these questions. And we're trying to take the next step in doing some new assay development on the patients that have already been treated to answer this very fundamental question. Because if the cure is going to be possible, and I truly hope and believe that it is, we really need to address this very fundamental question before we can move ahead. Okay, so now what I want to do is I'm going to break this into two parts. Where first of all, we're going to talk about a sterilizing immunity. This would be basically where you get rid of HIV completely from the body. So one of the issues that you have, one of the challenges that I believe you're raising, is we don't even know whether, ongoing, whether virus is still replicating. We do know that when a person is on triple therapy, the virus stays in the body. So what I want to ask each person on this panel is, what do you think is the greatest challenge to achieving sterilizing immunity? And why, if, if you believe it's possible, what gives you the most hope for believing that sterilizing immunity is possible? Not a functional cure where there's still some virus, but it's held under control, but sterilizing immunity, sterilizing cure. Why don't you begin? I think we're beginning to, you know, through, through an investment in, in basic science. Um, in fact, a lot of the work that AMFAR funded in, in the laboratories of, of folks like David Margolis and Mario Stevenson, we're beginning to understand on a molecular basis, you know, how HIV actually remains hidden um, in cells. And I always believe that, um, that by, when you have a, a really deep understanding of the molecular biology, you can find very specific ways of intervening. I mean, that's a, essentially what we did um, in, uh, in the development of the integrase inhibitor program that, that, uh, that I led at Merck for. Uh, for a number of years, and it, it was really an understanding of the, of the basic science that allowed us to develop um, the, the tools first, um, and, then, and then secondly, the molecules 
that would specifically um, work in 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 that uh, in that particular mechanism. And I and I think we're beginning to develop that sort of understanding of of the molecular basis of latency that will uh, that will allow us to do to do similar things. I think for me, uh, the greatest challenge is the one that uh, that Marty art articulated, and, and and that is having the assays that are sensitive enough to be able to demonstrate that you've been able to intervene in a meaningful way. Because um, you're looking for, as, as Carl nicely illustrated, that needle in a haystack. Right. Regan, talk well, to me about what gives you hope and what you think is the biggest challenge. Yeah, I mean, given my scientific peers here, I'll let them talk about the science. But I'll make a, um, a, a, the point that you know, we talk about HIV as a manageable disease. It's a chronic condition. And as someone who's taken drugs for 16 years, this is not something that can go on. So functional versus sterilizing cure, if we could really eradicate this from the body and really bring a person with HIV to the place of not having to take medication daily, um, the amount of life that you gain back in that experience is radical. And when we talk about the different types of cure, um, we think about how they could be implemented and what would be the real life implications for that. Um, it is not easy to do anything every day, even if it's down to three pills a day and the side effects being what they are, much better, but still very, very difficult to, to withstand for many people. So um, I think not only do we have to find a cure, but a cure that is one that is tolerable to people and functional in the real world. So um, a sterilizing cure is perhaps the holy grail. Right. If we didn't have to do anything. And so this is what really worries me, is that I'm going to succeed in knocking out 999 out of a thousand HIV viruses and, and that one's going to come back and recede the whole thing and we'll be back where we started. And this is why two things, uh, two points I want to make. One is that this is not a zero-sum game. I believe in what these guys are doing even though it's different from what we're doing and I, and I believe in the vaccines and the preventions because all these things need to work together because I'm not sure any one of us can get rid of every last virus. Absolutely. And I also really love this idea of the sterile or, or, or of the functional cure. Well, then let's talk about that. Let's move from sterilizing to functional. What are the challenges and what do you it, think? Well, I think it's because it gives, us, it gives us an intermediate goal where we can define success because we've changed somebody's life. We've made, we've given life back. I love that. Um, with maybe not such a high bar that we've gotten rid of every last virus. I mean, we, we need to give ourselves intermediate um, mile markers of success. And then, yeah, we'll keep working. You know, this is what we do as scientists. We'll keep working until we get rid of every last one. But, you know, give us a break, too. I mean, you know, <laughs> Timothy's pretty happy right now, right? I think, you know, from, from hearing your story. So, and you know, we want to recreate this kind of story and, and, and give us some successes in the near term that we can build upon. Marty, what's the challenges and hope for a functional cure? Well, first of all, I'm not so sure I separate the two. I agree with that. Number yes. one. Um, I train as, a, as an oncologist, so by nature I'm incredible, incredibly optimistic because when I went into oncology, you had to be optimistic to, to go into it because um, um, there were not many cancers that were quote unquote curable, but when I went into oncology, Hodgkin's disease had gone from a near uniformly fatal disease of mostly young people to an eminently treatable disease. And where I went to medical school at Stanford, that was the home of the quote unquote cure for Hodgkin's. And when we started talking about triple combination therapy in 1995, the therapeutic novelism in the treating community was enormous. People did not believe it. And I think here we are now, many years later, and people have accepted the treatment of HIV infection now as fact. And there have been enormous goals, uh, uh, strides made in the ability to treat patients effectively. And that is, the treatment side. But then on the research side, you always have to say that is not enough. And we have to strive to do better. So what can we strive to do better? Well, we can go back to the oncology model. We can figure out ways to reduce residual viral burden to minimal amounts. And then we have to say, now what can we do? Well, we might be able to pull residual virus out of places where it is. That's one way. Number two, we might make the host relatively resistant to the relatively small amounts of virus that are left by genetic manipulation, et cetera. We might even take that immune, the immune system of the host and boost it so when we pull the drugs away, it's kind of ready 
to handle that little bit of virus that's left. So in my mind, it might take that and that and that to actually achieve something that can result in something you heard about this morning. And that's a starting point. And then we have to try to achieve something that's practical, something that's affordable, something that can be given to many people. Remember, triple combination therapy could not be used in the third world. In 1999, that was the mantra. You went to Durban, no one was getting triple combination therapy. But those statements of fact were not fact, they were just bad opinion, and they were proven <laughs> wrong. And I think that's, that's where we are right now. You have to basically fund basic research, which is what AMFAR has always done, get better understanding, think creatively, and then try to get as, as much experience as you can, and then almost work, then when you, when you get to where you want to be, then start working backwards and making your, your, your um, advances available to as many people as possible. And we're at the beginning of it, frankly. Look, let me ask Daria a hard question. So, I, and I hate to do this because it's, it's, it's kind of mean, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to put on my journalist hat and do it anyway. <laughs> so, so, you know, you're at a pharmaceutical company. You owe it to your shareholders to make a profit. You've got these drugs which people have to take for life. It's a guaranteed income stream for Merck. Now you're coming along and you're saying two things. You're saying, I'm going to create a cure, which will mean I won't have these people on a lifetime of drugs. And second of all, I'm going to do it for a disease that there's a million people of in the United States and all the rest of them are in really poor countries that can't pay for it. I could be investing that money in all kinds of other things, in cancer, in, 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 in diseases, diabetes, diseases which have a much higher potential for revenue. Why, why is Merck doing this? Because it's the important thing to do. Um, it's, it's obvious that, you know, as, as Carl said, we, we can't treat our way out of the epidemic. And the, the economic burden on, you know, on the world is just absolutely enormous. And so it's, it's really important. And I personally believe just as in the early days of, of the epidemic, um, when we didn't know, you know how to treat people, it was really um, the collaboration between the pharmaceutical industry, the regulatory authorities, the academic scientists, physicians, um, and, and the community that made it all happen. And I think if, if we're going to be successful in, uh, in, in finding a cure for HIV, we need that same sort of collaborative advocacy, and the pharmaceutical companies have to have a seat at that table, otherwise it won't happen. Great. You're doing gene therapy. Right now, I don't believe, correct me if I'm wrong, that there's any gene therapy that is approved for use by the FDA that could be marketed by a company like Merck. I, I could be wrong about that, but I believe that that's correct. What are the what are the challenges that the two of you have to overcome so that we could have a gene therapy approach that you could sh give a shot to people and they would be cured of AIDS? Yeah, well, that's one of the really nice things about this uh, Martin Delaney collaboratory approach. There's three of them in the United States, and, and you know, one is based in Seattle, and, and then one in California, North Carolina, and Merck is collaborating with them. And, so it's giving us a chance to talk with, with other people and, and, and us to get to know each other a little bit more. You know, right now, gene therapy is not really at a place where we're really even thinking about scale up and manufacturing to that sort of level. We have a corporate partner, uh, an industrial partner, Sangamo, who you heard about, who's very involved in the gene therapy. Um, they're a smaller company. They're not a, a multi-billion dollar international pharmaceutical company. Um, they still maybe think small, more like an academic lab, maybe. Um, but eventually, we want to figure this thing out. And then you get into those questions, how do you package this up? How do you make more of it? How do you make it efficiently, affordable, deliver it, get the word out? And you know, those are the sorts of issues that I think we're, we're learning the, the, the people who may ultimately have some interest. But you know, in terms of FDA approval and a marketed uh, you know, single, single drug, we're, we're a ways away from that right now. So we have a lot of work to do, um, you know, proving our principle and, and, and getting our one person who we can get to sit up here and say, here's somebody we've cured before we can really get to that point. Let's open it up for questions. Who's got a question for these folks? Do we know whether the, um, do we know whether the, um, the HIV is hiding in the individual cell or is it 
in the organ, a specific organ, is it, or is it in every cell? And I'm, I'm not clear on the understanding. So you, the thing is, is that it, the virus, you know, when you say it's hiding, I mean, it's, it's a little bit of a simplification because if you take somebody who's been on treatment for a long period of time, in general, you could find virions in their plasma. You can find cells that are harboring DNA, viral DNA, and you can find, it, it's easy to find circulating T cells. You take them out of the body, you do a PCR test, and you can find a signal. You can even find cells, T cells, that are expressing virus, okay? But the numbers of cells that are actually infected that when you pull the drug away that can make virus that can then go on to infect a cell and initiate rapid rounds of replication are relatively rare and kind of hard to find. So with our current technology, the only way we can find them is to take a massive amount of T cells out of a patient, take those T cells and just whip them and whip them and whip them in a culture dish and finally they'll start making virus. Okay, so, so that's the whole problem, and that's just the peripheral blood. There are cells that are susceptible, and only 2% of your cells, T cells, circulate. Most of them are parked in your body, in your gastrointestinal tract, in your spleen, in your organs. So, yeah, so there are T cells everywhere that in small numbers of them that probably harbor infectious virus. And then there are cells that are not T cells, that are, that are related to macrophages, et cetera, that live in the brain and other places that probably have virus. So let and me I see if I can just summarize yeah. that in, 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 in maybe a simpler way. I heard you say that there are, you can find cells that circulate in the blood that are capable of that have HIV, and that HIV is capable of being active, of starting a new infection. That is correct, but interestingly... But, but only 2% of the, the cells, of T cells, the kind of cells that get infected with HIV are circulating in the blood. 98% of T cells, the kind of cells that HIV infects, that HIV would hide in, are in other parts of the body. For example, your gut or your lymph nodes in different sections of the body. So to answer your question, HIV is hiding inside of cells, and those cells are distributed, if I'm correct, in many different parts of your body. And that's one of the reasons why eradicating HIV from an entire human body is a challenge. Is that right? And it's also really interesting that if you took a bunch of patients and they're very similar Let's say you start them on treatment within 90 days of infection, treat them with the exact same drugs. They take their drugs religiously. When you, when you look and see how much infectious virus you have after, let's say, two years of treatment, patient one has X amount of virus, and patient two has a thousand times as much. Why? And we don't even, we don't understand that very basic question. So there's so much we don't know about HIV still, you know, 30 years into this. But one thing we do know is that patient one and patient two taking those pills phenotypically look okay. But when we start thinking about how we're gonna go to the next frontier, we have to understand why one patient has a little bit of virus left over and one patient has not, because maybe it's the patient with a little bit of virus who will be more easily cured than the patient who has a lot. Maybe we should focus on that patient than the patient over here. It's kind of a little bit about you know, another cancer analogy. If you have a really good cancer drug and you give it all to terminally ill patients who have taken every other therapy for cancer, you might not see the benefit. But if you use a new drug sometimes in the right setting, a very early stage cancer, you might see something miraculous. So these are the kinds of variables, I think, that we still have to work on and understand better. I, I do want to spend some time on gene therapy. 
So I want you to sort of explain, we, we just heard that, that HIV can hide mm -hmm. in cells in many different parts of the body. If you were going to take your sort of very targeted scissors and go into cells and snip out CCR5 or do some other magic that would make the cells uh, resistant to HIV, you'd have to get to a pretty large percentage of the target cells. How would you deliver these miraculous scissors, as it were, that can snip out the bad portions or the unwanted portions of DNA to these cells? Sure. So, you know, when we started this project, we sort of felt like there were three hurdles. One was determining if we had these scissors, would they snip genes and would that, would we be able to modify them to, to mess them up? So could we knock out CCR5 or, 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 or similar genes? And, and very clearly the answer was yes. And then the, the next really huge hurdle was can we really take these proteins and the sequences that they recognize in nature and, and change them. So really make the designer protein to recognize the sequence we want. And the answer is clearly yes now. And now we're at hurdle three, which is exactly this. How do you get them where they need to go? This is 90% this is of what we're doing in my laboratory now. Um, and like many things, you know, you see these gradations of difficulty, sort of like we talked about a minute ago. And one really fundamental question that we don't understand is for a CCR5 knockout, for example, what percentage of CCR5 do we need to knock out? Now, you know, yours was complete, right, because you got a transplant from somebody who, who had no CCR5. With our gene therapy approaches like we're doing them now, we could maybe knock out 15 or 20 percent pretty easily. Is that enough? Well, actually, we don't really know the answer to that. So one of the things that we're trying to answer is exactly that. How good do we have to be? Um, it's easier if you take the cells out, treat them, and then put them back. Okay, we can get higher percentages. Now, that's not especially practical if we want to go into third world settings, right? Which we want to do. We want, what we do, we, we want to be available to everybody. Okay, so now we've got to figure out a way to do this in the body with a single shot. Our percentages go down. Okay, when we do that with the current technology. So what are we trying to do? We have a lot of different approaches. Um, we're casting a broad net now. One is to use modified viruses. Um, we, we take them and we change them so that they don't can cause disease, but we turn their, um, their ability to get into cells. We take that part of it, this ability to enter cells. We take that and use it to introduce our proteins or the genes encoding our proteins, the, the molecular scissors we're talking about. We're also trying completely artificial structures, things called aptamers, and I won't go into what they are, but, but they're completely artificial, but they can kind of do that thing. They find their cell and go into it. We're even engineering certain cells because we know the biology. Uh, the point was made, we learned from the immunologists and from the vaccinologists. So we know so much now about what cells love to interact with T cells. And one of the really fun ideas we're trying is, could we use those cells that, that seek out interaction with T cells, and when they make that interaction, could they just pass on our proteins during that? So there's a variety of ways, and, and what we're doing now is just seeing which ones of these actually work. If they're incomplete, um, which cells do they miss? And maybe would, they would work together very well. So you know, you've really hit on the critical question, and, and this is what's keeping us going into the lab every day and excited. Uh, other questions that people have? This. Is that gene therapy done strictly in the lab, or is it done on uh, subjects, human or other um, animal? Well, sure, there's, there's some, some is being done now, absolutely. Some of the T cell therapy with a class of proteins called zinc finger nucleases, it's one class. You, of you, you mean in experiments, though, not, not available uh, oh, These are in doctor. experimental clinical trials now with small numbers of patients. Um, so nothing is broadly available now. Um, our bias has been a little bit to step back from, from hurrying too fast into trying to make these things broadly available so that we really understand what we're doing better. We, we want to take a little more cautious approach, um, do this stepwise so that, first of all, we know what we're doing is safe, critically important, and then that w we don't get, you know, a, a, a few, you know, flashy results that, that we can't repeat, you know, that we want to take this in a very step, uh, and step, step by step and logical uh, format and really understand what we're doing as we move forward. But, 
you know, as Jeffrey said, we, we would all be very disappointed. You know, we want to do this in our lifetimes, right? And we understand that there are people who are infected now who are looking for, for therapy. So, so we're trying to do this as responsibly and as quickly as we possibly can. Daria, you talked about how Merck is interested in flushing out the virus from those places that, that Marty was describing where the virus quote unquote hides. How are you doing that? And what stage of the research is that work in? <clears throat> so we're, we're looking for drugs um, that can actually induce HIV to express um, out, of the, out of its latent or, or quiescent state. And by express, you mean start replicating? Start expressing, start okay. replicating. Um, one of the most advanced, and I use that in quotes, uh, uh, approaches is um, to use um, a, um, a, uh, uh, a class of, of compounds um, that affect um, gene expression called HDAC inhibitors. Uh, Merck has a, uh, a compound in that class that's licensed to treat um, uh, cancer. Um, it's certainly not licensed um, for HIV infection, but at least it provides uh, a, a tool, a uh, compound that can be used to explore whether or not this concept um, is valid. And so we're using that um, particular compound as a tool to, to explore um, this hypothesis that you can actually um, induce HIV out of hiding um, in both monkeys, um, the primate model that was uh, just uh, alluded to earlier, um, as well as in some very small clinical uh, experiments, human experiments in HIV-infected patients who are well-controlled. So we have two uh, very small pilot studies, um, one in the U.S. And, and one in Australia, to, to actually address whether or not um, this uh, idea or this hypothesis um, can, can actually be demonstrated um, in humans. We're out of time. I want to thank our distinguished panelists who did a terrific job, and I believe there is a lunch.